Welcome to the Republican Professor this morning in California. For both of us, we have the most ex awesome guest in the entire reality world. And yeah. I mean world the same way Reinhardt Grossman means it as the sum total of things that exist. Of so course, if we had God. All possible universes, right? Ooh, even better. Wow. Is that how he means it? Well, yeah, the sum total of all that exists. So, well, all the possible universes in the actual world, I guess. I don't know. Well, I guess besides God, um, it would be, it would have to be uh, Dr. Rasmussen. And your first name, how do you say it? Is it Hosh? It, well, some people call it Joshi, like my wife sometimes. How do you say San Jose? Um, San how, do you Jose. Say, how do you say Trader Hoes? Uh huh. For me, it's Josh. How do you say Ho Biden? Okay, Josh, yeah. got it. See, this, I wanted this, to be this, sensitive to your culture, you know. If you know, Josh, Lucas, dude, this is this is what I love about you. This is what I was saying before the show is that when I met you at Biola, <laughs> you just always had that grin on your face, and you made me laugh more than anybody else. We'd be hanging out and we'd be talking philosophy, and then you'd just be making me laugh. And I was telling my wife Rachel that. When I think about you, there's like this picture profile of you with that little grin, like the one you're making right now. <laughs> That's how I think of you. So anyway, it's great to see you again. It's yeah, just it's wonderful great to see you too. I've enjoyed uh, kind of watching you from afar. Uh, I know that you went uh, from Biola. Well, everybody, this is Josh Rasmussen, teaches philosophy. He uh, He's now, I think you're kind of a big deal now. Um, I've always been a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> not like, I mean, you're, it's not like you've gained weight. That's not what you mean by that. Uh -huh. Um, you, you're, you're still slim, but you're a big deal. Um, but you went to, uh, uh, I don't know how you say it. Not, not, not re da Dame, not re Dame. Close enough. University okay. of Notre Dame. Some people pronounce it that way. They're there. Oh yeah. From Rudy. But, yeah. I should have known that. Yeah. So did you, did you enjoy your time at Notre Dame? Yeah, it was a playground. I loved it. Um, I enjoyed wow. talking with Alvin Plantinga there when he was there. And the cool thing about that uh, him is that he was kind of like so famous that nobody wants to talk with him. So yeah, they all thought he was busy. So I would go to his office hours and we would just have these chats and he, he blew me away more than anybody else um, ever. Mm. Wow. When I would talk with him in person, he he was Whoa. kind of more profound in person than even in print, which surprised me. Some philosophers, it's more the opposite. Um, wow. I'm very impressed by them in print. And then I talk with them in person and it's like, oh, OK, you're actually a real human being. Although I will say that the first encounter with Alvin Plantinga, uh, I don't know, it's kind of embarrassing, but we went to the bathroom <laughs> and we were peeing next to each other. And I just looked over at him. I thought, hmm, I'm peeing next to Alvin Plantinga. That was like my first uh, experience. <laughs> the way you said it in your mind, though, did did you say it is the case that I'm peeing next to? The proposition that I'm peeing next to Alvin Plantinga wow. appears to me to be true. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. yeah, that corresponds to that proposition corresponds to reality. <laughs> yeah, that's it. You got it. Yeah. Wow. So I loved it there. It was I felt like I learned a lot. Did you talk yeah. to him when you were peeing? Uh, I think I said hi. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, it's kind of, it's not like the best time to talk about philosophy. <laughs> kind of echoey and yeah, I don't know. Okay, wow. Lucas, help us out of the bathroom. Where do we go from here? Alvin Plantinga, for those of you who don't know, is a famous Christian philosopher. Um, and it's kind of hard to fully grasp, I think, the significance of a story like that if you don't know just how just in what kind of shape christian philosophy was for i would say most of the 20th century right um the the philosophy departments seemed to have been overtaken by non-christian um people yeah, you know, to say the least. Um, and there for a time was uh, actually hostility, I would say, uh, to Christian philosophers. And um, 
Alvin planning uh, was a part, a huge part of changing that. I would say, wouldn't you say that's true? He's definitely had a lot of impact in kind yeah. of the intellectual landscape. Uh, the nature of the conversations have definitely shifted in the wake of his work. Um, mm -hmm. That was yeah, toward the end of the, toward the last part of the 20th century started becoming yeah. well known. Yeah. And he's very impressive. I think he combines this ability to go very, very deep mm -hmm. with an ability to communicate in a way that feels very ordinary. So it, it kind of mm -hmm. tricks you in a way because yeah, um, this shows up in his work, but also in his teaching. It's like, you think that he's just leading you on an ordinary path. And then all of a sudden you realize you've reached to some conclusions that you didn't think like you could get there through that path. And mm -hmm. he just sort of leading it along the way. And, and he would know these very obscure things, like things that I would maybe discover about set theory or some mathematical principle. And, and then he would just know that very specific detail, same with history. So it's like this combination of that library mind, the depth of insight. Wow. It's hard to combine those both. Um, yeah. And like I said, it was, it was like more impressive even in person because I would have, well, my style is to explore the edges, find out where people have stopped and then try to explore beyond that. So right. I would be, you know, walking around um, the street, thinking, walking around a lake, thinking, making new paths in my mind. Yeah. And then I would talk with Alvin Flanaga in his office about my own explorations. And it was like, he had already been there uh -huh. <laughs> or if he hadn't, he just like quickly saw three things that connect there and no, wow. no other professional philosopher did that for me. Wow. Uh, like Peter Van Wagen, well, he impressed me in lots of ways too, but it wasn't quite in that same way. So I feel like from a distance, there's all these like trees and they kind of blend together in the forest and you get close and you see, oh, okay, this tree has something very special. Um, yeah. So yeah, Al Alvin Planiga, he definitely had a big impact on me for sure. I've only met him a couple of times and I was always kind of, in, I just observed him from afar, but I, I caught enough, uh, I think, of his interaction where uh, I, I was able to see that he's a normal guy like you would yeah, that's see it. him at the grocery store probably. And you would never know. He's like a famous philosopher. Yeah. I saw him at the grocery store. It Did was, you really? bitter, yeah, it was cold, bitterly cold and dark. And I, I saw he told him, me this story one time. Well, yeah, I'm it interested. fascinated me because yeah. he was pushing his cart. Mm -hmm. He emptied his cart into his cart and he was pushing it yeah, a long way, it. all the way to put it back. Yeah. And I saw him. So I went up to him. I was like, hey, Alvin planning. Go, hey, Al, or however, you, you know, <laughs> I guess you go by first anyway. Hey. And then um, I asked him why he pushed his cart all the way to the cart rack. Because I just put my <laughs> cart next to my car. I'm I'm cold. I want to get out of there. Right. But he said something like, like, well, Josh, you know, that kind of deep voice. Well, Josh, I don't want to contribute to lawlessness. Yeah. yeah. And it was like he was serious. Like, you know, yeah. and, and this is with nobody watching. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, he didn't know yep. how he was watching, you know, and he just doesn't want to contribute to lawlessness. So he's putting his cart. Well, away. That's why he put his cart way far. Was it, was there snow on the ground? Oh yeah, it was. So he was plowing cold. through snow with this, this crazy cart. And it's because he doesn't want to con uh, contribute to lawlessness by just leaving it out. Yeah. It's like, he wants to do his part as, you know, a person contributing to the goodness of the world, even that's in that way. Yeah. yeah, that's a legit story. And that says a lot about him. And I, you told me that story, I think probably 10 years ago. Yeah. And I think we were at some kind of bar or night. It wasn't a nightclub. A nightclub. <laughs> it was I feel nightclub. like it just felt like a nightclub, but it couldn't have been a nightclub because I don't go to nightclubs. It must have been like a bar, maybe yard house or something. But it seemed like we were having drinks and there was a bunch of philosophy people there. And I was, I just remember you telling me that and you had to yell it, I think. But yeah. Um, but it was, it was a cool story and it, I still really enjoy that story. Um, what your connection with Peter Vanenwagen was a little different cause he's got a different personality or is it because you disagree with him about things or well, he how's, was, the, how's the connection there? It's a good connection. Um, it wasn't so much that we disagreed exactly, but okay. he was my, my dissertation advisor. So oh, he it was, yeah. Oh. yeah. So he helped me work through sort of my ideas. It was interesting because in my proposal, I had this idea about these abstract states of affairs, like the state of affairs of you and I talking. Right. And there's this question about whether these states of affairs could exist 
maybe mm-hmm. in somebody's mind, even if they're not actually in the world. Like there's a state of affairs of you and I never existing. Mm-hmm. You know, that state of affairs maybe exists, but it's not actually in the world. So I, I had this idea. I remember um, being with my wife, Rachel, and telling her about my idea that I wanted to be like this expert on states of affairs. You know, I mean, that mm-hmm. that's a great topic for a philosopher. It's like very abstract. It's a foundational building block of like everything else or whatever. Uh, yeah. So I want to be an expert. So I had my dissertation proposal and I had this idea that um, I want to have an account of how states of affairs are like properties and that they can just like properties maybe exist, like the property of being a person could exist. Um, and then that property could be instantiated in a person. Maybe states of affairs could exist and then be instantiated. So I presented this uh, and Peter Vanderwagen, he said to me, I thought this was a brilliant thought. He said, well, you know, Josh, these states of affairs are abstract. They have a kind of structure to them. And they're kind of like propositions in a way. Propositions mm-hmm. are abstract, they have a structure. You're talking about the states of affairs being instantiated and people who talk about propositions being true Right. That's kind of like the state of affairs being instantiated. So you said maybe you, you're you actually thinking about a correspondence theory of truth. Maybe that's what you're thinking uh, about. It actually leads into our topic here. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so he was the one who gave me that idea of the connection. And for me, my interest in the nature of truth was purely out of this interest in this building block of reality, the, these sort of structured abstract concepts or, or right. whatever they are, properties. And then how do they relate to reality? How do the things in your mind relate to things in the world? It's like, oh, well, there's this relation. Call it truth, call it instantiation, call it obtaining. You can call it different things, but there's this kind of relation. So he led me into that. And then I just wanted to say that working with him was just so good for me because he desires clarity. So yeah. every word he was asking me to define that word. Mm-hmm. And, and I kind of had this implicit competition with him because <laughs> he, unlike Al, he didn't like smile. So for example, one time he was on a trip for a month. So we didn't meet for a while and I came back and I asked him, so uh, Peter, how was your trip? And he doesn't smile at all. He just looks at me one word. He says, have you ever seen him smile? <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've seen him smile. Yes. But okay. in those days, I think he was almost kind of playing that role too. Like he was yeah. kind of getting into that role and gotcha. he just says one word. He says, complicated. That's it. That was his trip. Complicated. And then, mm-hmm. then I was like, well, it's, it's great to see you, you know, again, you know, I, I miss you. I'm, I'm kind of pl- trying to play with him, see if I can get that smirk, you know, kind of like, yeah, yeah, smirk yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, nothing. yeah. nothing. And then nothing. he said something like, um, well, you know, how, how are you, you know, Josh? And then I teased him because I started in the beginning, I was more intimidated. Let me say my, my heart kind of accelerated when I would meet with him. But after about a year, I was more relaxed. I was kind of playing with him a little bit. So he said, like, Josh, how are you? And I said, Peter, you, you, you're just saying that you, you're, you're just trying to be polite. You're not really wanting to know how I am. And I'm thinking he might <laughs> smile a little bit, not think nothing. <laughs> He's like, all right, let's talk about your dissertation. It's wow. Like, right. So he was playing that role, but he was a lot of fun for me because yeah. of the precision of his um, clarity that he was. Yeah. Pers- yeah. Was he always on like ready to go um, or did he ever have a bad day? He never had a bad day. No. Wow. I mean, if he was like a, a chess master, you know, he would always play the game. If that, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah. 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 What, uh, what kind of courses did you have and who did you have? What were your favorite courses at Notre Dame? Well, I took a Phil mine course with Alvin Plantinga. Which Ooh, I how cool. Uh, yeah. That was fun. We spent like a month trying to define physicalism. You know, really? Wow. Physicalism? Yeah. Because, you know, there's this question. It's, it's like, the philosophy of minds kind of preoccupied with these theories of, of the physical world is do our minds reduce to the physical world or is it a kind of non-reductive physicalism? And so planning on wanting to get clear, like, what do we mean by physical? Um, so right. that, that was helpful. That was interesting. Um, let's see what else. Uh, metaphysics class with Peter Van and Wagen was fun. Um, yeah. I'm thinking about stories in that class. He, Peter was kind of intimidating. Uh, to the students sometimes. I've, but heard, I think I've was, heard that before. Yeah. I, I told a, a philosophy professor at a conference one time that planning is uh, not planning a, a fan and wagon is kind of intimidating. And then this philosophy professor said, yeah, he, he intimidates all of us. <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> oh, really? But there, he's wow. got this powerful intellect. And, and I think that he sort of backs it up with, um, you know, sort he, of he never smiles. Clarity, so <laughs> without the smile, he, he does smile. So, and there were times like, at a colloquium where we talk and he was very kind 
and met my my wife and was definitely smiling. So I think he does play a little bit of a role. Like when he's in that philosophy mode, it's like right. he's the beast, you know? Yeah. So, so yeah, he's great. Uh, who was on your dissertation committee? So let's see. It was Mike Ray, uh, Peter Van Wagen, Alvin Plantinga. I think Robert Audi maybe was there. Really? Um, it's hard for me to remember. Yeah, well, that's quite a committee there. Jeez. What was your uh, dissertation on? It was on this correspondence theory of truth, uh, which became my book, Defending the Correspondence Theory. And by the way, I defended it not because I believed it. Uh, is because I thought I could respond to all the objections. I didn't really start really thinking, no, I think this is true. This theory mm -hmm. of truth is true uh, after I started teaching it in the classroom. Really? Yeah. I think there was something about wow. motivating the theory. Uh -huh. I was kind of agnostic between this sort of um, it's just, truth is just basic and unanalyzable. And then this relational account of truth, which we, we'll talk about. But yeah, I was sort of agnostic between those two views. And yeah. But when I was teaching it in the classroom, I would take like books and throw them across the room just to get their attention. Mm -hmm. And then I would say, notice how your, you know, belief that the book is on the table went from true to not true. And I didn't yeah. even touch your mind. Like I didn't even touch your belief. All I did was touch the reality. I threw, you know, I, I moved reality and your belief, the truth value went from true to false. Right. And those examples, it's like, well, you know what? The best explanation of all those examples is the simplest theory, which is that the nature of truth is correspondence. Mm. Yeah. So that that's when I was like, I think this is this theory of truth is true. So if you are hanging on so far, everybody, you are probably gathering that uh, we're we're trying to ramp up to a theory of truth, but we're also peppering it with liberally or conservatively, I guess, depending on your perspective. Well, you can't use uh, that word liberal. Are you allergic <laughs> to the word liberal? Um, well, we're trying to pepper it with uh, human stories from these colorful personalities. And uh, you you wrote this book on truth, which was your dissertation topic. That's and it. Yeah. and um, by the way, what what's that book going for on Amazon? How much do you think it is? <laughs> I don't know. They <laughs> They charge like a hundred dollars or something because they sell it to Crazy. these libraries. So yeah, if somebody wants it. I I'm, I guess it's I shouldn't say this on air, but I'm happy to send you you know a preprint. I'll t I'll take one. I'll take one because I I think I've 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 I think I poked around a while back when I was think planning this out. I think actually it was like six months ago that I asked you to to be on, and um, so we were we were planning this out, and I was like, yeah, I think that this is a topic that I want to cover is the nature of truth, and uh, the nature of truth is interesting because it it just like all philosophy, it oftentimes gets into what we take for granted, and we yeah. don't really think stop and think very carefully about what's going on, but. Uh, when we say uh, something is true, be interesting to see uh, what we properly mean by that. Um, and so you said the correspondence theory of truth is makes the best sense of like the data, I guess. Yeah. It's the simplest theory. Yeah. The, uh, assumption is the sim simplest theory is the most likely one to be correct. Other things being equal. Yeah. Other things being equal. And so people might, I think a lot of folks, when they hear the word theory, though, that when it, when you, it's kind of confusing because if you don't know what's going on in philosophy, you might think what, this is just a theory. Like, hold on a second. Uh, there's theories about truth and what truth is. And it, it just sounds like it, it might sound like a little suspicious, like, oh, well, this is you just picked a theory yeah. of truth. Um, so what do you, what do you say to that? Well, we could call it a hypothesis. Um, yeah. Yeah. Same problem. Right. Right. Um, you know, I, I think because people disagree a lot um, mm -hmm. and I, I want to kind of elaborate on this a little bit, but yeah, we'll come back to that in just a moment. Okay. 
because we we disagree so much, um, I think it's helpful in communication, of productive communication. If you present your own belief, even if you think your belief is knowledge, like you feel very certain of it um, as a hypothesis or as a theory, because, you know, that that doesn't sort of aggressively dismiss the people who would have a different belief about that. And then it invites more of a collaborative inquiry into it. So that that's kind of one note about that. But another note, well, well let me just go back to this little story, because yesterday my wife and I, we were hanging out, we were on a date and there was this uh, older guy and we just got talking with him and, and he was just telling us, you know, kind of who he is and how uh, he doesn't really have much of an education, but he just loves people, and, which is great. And so then he finds out I'm a, a philosopher. And his first statement to that uh, was, well, this is kind of his first and last. We didn't really dwell on this topic, but he said, oh, philosophy, that's where uh, there's no right answer. <laughs> yeah, that's the association, oh right? And I was thinking about that a little bit afterwards, and I thought yeah, that's really sad. Well, this is this is related to our conversation here about truth, because I think yeah. that the truth that he was pointing to is that there's no answer that we all agree on. Yeah. And because there's no answer that we all agree on, now there's a question about whether there actually is a right answer. Mm. And I think this actually brings me back to why I care about this theory of truth uh, as correspondence, because if truth is about corresponding with reality for example the cat is on the mat it's true if there is this cat there on the mat there's this bit of reality of a cat on the mat we'll link that and, video that you did for philosophy wireless philosophy we'll link that yeah because it illustrates this concept of the cat is on the mat if that's true and truth is about the reality yeah. then it really doesn't matter if we agree or disagree the truth doesn't wait for our agreement and to right. me that humbles me because it means that it doesn't matter <laughs> what i believe Reality is what it is. I could yeah. be, I could be wrong. Um, and mm -hmm. you know, one of us has to be wrong if, if we disagree with each other. So, or maybe we're all wrong. So, right. Um, so I, I do think that presenting the theory of truth as a theory can be helpful because it creates that kind of uh, conversational humility. But I want to just mm -hmm. add this because I've actually become even more convinced of the theory through what I would consider to be a kind of direct experience with truth in my own mind uh if i could just illustrate this quickly so sure let's say that i feel you don't even have to do it quickly but let's say that i well there's so many topics that i feel all energized to cover all these different topics so you're right there's a lot there's a lot going on here but um but so let's say that I, let's just hypothetical let's say that i'm feeling a love for you um just hy hypothetical we don't have to assume that's true right i'm feeling love okay now i have in my mind this thought or proposition whatever you want to call it that i'm feeling love for you i have that in my mind okay now i can check in my feeling if in fact i am feeling that love for you and okay. now because directly both, directly Dur yes and because of direct this, access to how you feel yes what you're saying you got it and both items the feeling and the thought about the feeling they're both in my mind so both of them i have direct access to and then if you ask me, is right. it true, Josh, is it true that you feel this way? I can just check. Mm. And when I check, I'm seeing the connection between the thought and the reality. And then I can call that connection correspondence or truth or accuracy, call it whatever you want. Because sometimes people say, well, what is correspondence? It's a mystery. And even in my dissertation, I spent a long time trying to analyze correspondence. Right. I've gotten a little bit wiser <laughs> since then, which is that <laughs> not everything can be analyzed. Some things are just known mm. directly. Whoa. So I think that I've come to know directly that there is a correspondence relation between thoughts and reality. And then I'll use the word truth or out of neutrality, I might use the word correspondence truth to sort of leave open other concepts of truth. Um, that pick out other properties, but there is this actual property of corresponding to reality that I think that we can actually access directly and then know that it's real. Yeah. And so the know and the, that the theory is true. Yeah. And you're using knowledge. Do you, do you uh, think evidence is part of knowledge? It can be. Um, I think of evidence. As, so it kind of depends. So I think of evidence as that which makes evident. Uh, that's kind of a broad definition. Others might want to add more to that, but on this sort of broad definition, that which makes evidence, evident, 
I would say that all knowledge that you have is evident to you. Uh, it, it feels evident to you if you know it. But you okay. can have evidence. You can have evidence without knowledge. You can have something that looks evident, but it's not evident. Right. Enough. You can have evidence without knowledge. Can you have knowledge without evidence? I don't think on this definition of evidence, that which makes evident. I don't think you have knowledge without evidence on that. Def now, now, see, I have to be right. so clear because, you know, we mentioned Alvin Plantinga, right? Yeah. And there's this view, which you're very familiar with, called evidentialism, which yeah. is that all knowledge is, has to be based on evidence. And Alvin right. Plantinga is kind of famous for arguing against yes. evidentialism. That's right. Um, and so I, I, I can already else. sort of feel on the the way that your eyes were yeah. like switching there that you're aware of this debate and you're, you're watching. going under warrant. Uh, yeah. What he calls warrant, which is not the ex same thing as common sense evidence. Like, yeah. Um, anyway, you, I don't want to steal your thunder. You're... Well, just to elaborate a bit, I think sometimes when people use the term evidence, they have in mind a kind of public yeah. evidence that everybody has access to. Mm. But Plantinga gives examples of like private evidence, like of your own memories. And, and he might not use the term evidence. He might say there's this belief forming process that's properly functioning. Yeah. And and but on the de broader definition of just anything that makes evident, I'm pretty sure even Plantinga would agree that he, knowledge. He, he doesn't evidence. think you have to be aware of of. How the belief is formed exactly and right. um, be able to. I, I mean, I'm not sure I, if I'm getting off topic here, but the awareness issue mm -hmm. seems to be a big deal for evidentialists. Um, they want, well, anyway, kind of getting into internalism versus externalism. Yeah. I guess you could just define that uh, for us. Uh, inter and yeah. you seem to be an internalist to me. Yeah, I do correct? seem to be. So okay. my my term paper, you'll like this. So my term paper, oh, for yeah, yeah. planting a, uh, this is while I was dating Rachel. So I was dating her very intensely. I hung out with Rachel who became my wife. This is the name. Did of she live wife. in uh, South Bend there? She, we went to school together. She was uh, in a PhD chemistry program. No kidding. Wow. I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah. She's a PhD in chemistry. Well, she stopped at the master's and then, um, so she didn't get the PhD, but she was in the PhD program. Wow. That's a big deal. By the way, I think it's pronounced uh, chemistry. Just FYI. Yeah. I don't want you to be embarrassed <laughs> at parties and stuff. Thank you. How do you say, how do you say technology? Uh, technology. Some people say technology, right? But technology, yeah. Different speech for different dialects. All right. I'm just, I'm trying to roll with you here. <laughs> how, how do you say hot chocolate? I just want to make sure we're all right. Well, hot, anyway, hot chocolate. In other words, she is really good at math and she can look at yes. a table or a piece of wood and go, you know, know how much like nitrogen is in there. Yeah. She sees nitrogen and stuff like that in her mind. That's cool. Yeah. During our dating time, um, in the beginning, there was some kind of emotional ups and downs. Mm. And um, so I made some observations about her emotional ups, ups and downs. And she came up with a, an equation. It was Whoa. It, 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 that described, described it. And, um, but I set it up so that the equation would have to lead to her emotions being like in love with me. That's kind of how I set it up. <laughs> so she came up with the equation for that. So yeah, she's, she's very, very intelligent. You guys are made for each other apparently. Wow. So why? I, yeah. Did she write it on a napkin and there's like a little bit of ketchup on it, you know, on your date? Yeah. This, this you equation. can imagine it that way. It was on a computer, but yeah. Oh, the same, wow. Same idea, but okay. Where, where, wait, where was this date? <laughs> Is this it was at her apartment. Computer lab. Oh, okay. I gotcha. Yeah. Wow. So I, I've I, lost. Oh yeah. Because, okay. Planning is class. So internalism. I'm we're, we're going story back to story, but, but we were hanging out 13 hours a day. Um, you know, as any two people in love might do. Did you meet it at, at on the campus or was it at church or was it on the bowling league or I met her on campus. She was invited to hang out uh, with some friends. And uh, I think the person who invited her uh, liked her. They ended up dating for a little bit. Oh, huh. But that's how we met. Okay. And, and then we started hanging out with each other. That's a good way to meet people in a group setting. Yeah. Beautiful campus too, right? Yeah. 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 Wow. Sure. What a, it's very romantic. Yeah. So it was like at first sight. <laughs> and That's uh, awesome.
And so we would talk about science and philosophy and the boundaries between them. And I would tell her about my philosophy of science classes, which was probably annoying to her because mm. I'm telling her about the nature of science mm. as a philosopher, <laughs> yeah. right? Not a scientist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it was great. We uh, it takes a certain amount of humility to be able to listen to a philosopher talk about science, right? Yeah. But I mean, it's legit though. What philosophers say about science is totally legit. Just like if you hear Damn. me out, if you hear me out, yeah. Philosophy of science is a big deal. Yeah, it's, I think. I think I learned to be maybe humbler in my my presentations and and okay. maybe even my awareness because that conversation helped me to understand something that's helped me in many areas of life, which is that people tend to draw the circle around their field wider than people outside their field. So what oh. I found out was that things that philosophers would call philosophy, she would call science. She called it science. Really? It's part of science. You know, because wow. as philosophers, we work on this demarcation problem. Right. What's the boundary between science and philosophy? Mm -hmm. And how, how do you demarcate it? That's, yeah. that's why the it's named that is because it's about demarcate like a boundary yeah yeah like you can't come do uh, onto my turf because that's philosophy you, know? mm -hmm. <laughs> you can't be talking about quantum mechanics because you know you're not a physicist right so she, would she say defining science is a part of science then she would i i don't know i'd have to ask her about that but i think okay. she might what uh, was in science that you thought was in philosophy logic really logic yeah whoa that's uh, surprising to me. Yeah. In what way? I've taught logic for 15 years and I've never thought that I was doing science. Um, well, actually, our textbook does the textbook I've used mostly, which is uh, I've used different ones, but I've used uh, not Copy, but I have used Copy, but I'm thinking of Hurley. Hurley yeah. uses the word science in the definition, which yeah. is on page one or three, one okay. of those two pages. Yeah. yeah. It's the so, science of reasoning or something. Right. right. Yeah. He science does use the knowledge. word science. Yeah. Yeah. But he so, uses it in the classical sense of um, like scientia, like uh, Latin yes. for knowledge, basically uh, yeah. the old school way of, of trying to get knowledge. So, yeah. 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 So that, that's it. And that helped me, helped me to realize not just in that example, but like in general, uh, people yeah. who are physicalists define the word physical in a way that includes more objects mm -hmm. than people who are not physicalists. So mm -hmm. then there's a lot of talking past each other because okay. people are having a debate and they don't realize that their concepts are just different. Uh, and that's helped me a lot just to notice mm -hmm. that. Um, okay, internalism, externalism. Yeah. Well, I was what just going to say, I, I, took, about that? I took an incomplete in that class for Planiga because of my interest in Rachel. We were hanging out so much. So, but Which the next class was this? This, uh, uh, it was, it was, uh, this was epistemology. Oh, epistemology. Hey. Yeah. And this is where I made a paper for Planiga and I knew that Planiga is not an internalist. Okay. No, I, I like internalism. So my, argument, the title of my paper was something like from proper functionalism to internalism. And I made the argument that if proper mm. functionalism is true, then inter internalism is true. Whoa. So that he said it was a very interesting paper. I did get an A. Um, but I did it the next semester after Rachel and I were married and my life sort of stabilized a little bit. And <laughs> we weren't okay. just eating scene. Yeah. Had a little more time to think about the paper. Um, but yeah, so this debate has to do with awareness. It has to do with whether knowledge requires awareness. And I sort of think of awareness as just itself, just a form of knowledge. It's just a, a, a knowledge by direct acquaintance. And then I made this argument that a properly functioning system, so this is planning as idea that knowledge comes from properly functioning belief forming systems aimed at truth. Um, that system to get you knowledge is gonna go through the pathway of some kind of internal awareness or conscious awareness. Mm -hmm. So that that's what I did in that paper there. And you don't have to be aware that you're aware to be aware. That's kind of a key because I think you're aware of a lot more than you're aware mm -hmm. that you're aware of. Um, yeah. You, yeah. So you might be able to become aware that you're aware of it later. That's but it. You don't need to at the time for it to be knowledge, to be aware that you're aware of it. <laughs> that's it. And you might have a psychological <laughs> limit where you can't even be aware of your awareness though. In principle, you could yeah. like the kind of person who could in principle, 
but your psychological maybe, limits. Maybe, maybe give an example so that people have something to hold on yeah, to. Yeah, thanks for uh, that. So yeah. an example would be, um, this. okay, I'm going to think of a better example. The first one comes to my mind, it would be like, how do you know there are other people? You know, how do you know that you're not just the only one and you're not like hallucinating everything right. else, right? Yeah. God never and, minds. And I, I would argue that you can be aware of probability links between um, your experiences and causes of those experiences that make mm. sense of those experiences. Okay. And this gives you reason to think that probably there are other people. Um, but at, when I've I challenged- Probably you're another person. Yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> so, so I've challenged students, you know, how do you know that I'm real? you know, and, and they don't like the question very much, but it helps them to, my whole goal is to help yeah. them to see the powers they have to know. And one right, of the right, right, right. you have is to know introspectively your own experiences and then yeah. prob probability connections. But the point is, is that I think that they are aware of those experiences and the probability connections, even mm -hmm. without being aware of their awareness. Yeah. And, and not being able to articulate exactly yeah. what it is. Like yeah. when I walk by the mirror in the morning, I don't think that that's probably another person. Right. I think it's probably me. Yeah. Even though I'm not directly aware of, of how I look on moment by moment. I mean, it, it helps to have a mirror, but I, I do seem to be aware of my own existence directly. Yeah. And, and when I walk, uh, in front of the mirror, I, I, I feel like I, I'm aware that I'm moving. Yeah. I seem, I seem to be moving. Yeah. <laughs> and then I see an image and it looks a lot like the last one that appeared. Maybe it's a different shirt or something. Um, but you know, last one appeared the last time I walked by that mirror. Yeah. Um, and I think that that means it's overwhelmingly likely that that that's me. Yeah. Or at least. Now that, okay, when I say that's me, maybe we should talk about the mind and the body really quick and personal identity. Yeah. What do you think about um, saying that that's me when I look in the mirror? Do you think that um, I really mean that's my body and that's not really me or because I have a body, but I'm not a body? Yeah. Or do you think that uh, animalism is uh, more correct for for what we are. Yeah. So like, yeah, I love the question. So something that kind of helps me think about this is when I'm having a dream, can I be aware of myself in my dream? Right. Um, so I've had dreams where I've kind of figured out a trick to know whether I'm dreaming. And the trick is that if I ever, well, I have to come into a lucid enough dream where I wonder like, is, is this real? Mm -hmm. And I notice that I never really wonder that when I'm awake. And so <laughs> yeah, right. because of that, now I have this inference. If I'm wondering, then I know that it's just a dream. Yeah. And well, you don't do that, drugs. Works. So FYI, everybody who doesn't do, who does do drugs and is checked out right now, you might want to get sober and then re-listen to this. Yeah. The principle probably applies in general, right? Like if you're ever wondering, is this real? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe not. I don't know. I think a lot of people that are doing this whole thing, you know, ever since it was legalized. Maybe. I don't know. And I don't know from firsthand experience, but okay. yeah, me neither. Um, yeah, but that fits my experience. Yeah. yeah. I really so, so I can that. then, then kind of take control of my dreams. I know I'm dreaming, but here's my point is that I've also been aware of myself in my dreams. Um, mm -hmm. and, and my awareness of myself doesn't depend on an awareness of a particular spatial configuration of objects. Like even in my dream, have you ever had a dream where you look in a mirror and your teeth are falling out? Have you ever had yeah. that? Yeah, yeah, it's a stressful dream. Yeah, it's very stressful. Then you it wake up and writing your dissertation relieved. when you had that one. Yeah. But the point is, is that those teeth there in the dream, those are spatial configura um, configurations or representations of spatial configurations. Mm -hmm. But the point is, I don't have to be aware of any particular body, any spatial configuration to be aware of myself. <clears throat> now, when I'm yeah. holding my newborn, and sometimes my newborn is like five months old, will see himself in the mirror. And he'll smile because he tends to smile when he sees a face now. Oh. But I'm not sure he knows that that's his own face, right? Oh. So he doesn't have enough experience to make the inference, the very intelligent inference you're making that that yeah. is him, right? Because right, it's right, right, a little right, more right. experience. Yeah. Yeah.
So I don't think you have to to know that. That's a good example. That's your body to be aware of of yourself. <clears throat> mm. I, I argue for this in, in my upcoming book on persons. I have a whole chapter on yourself, and I in every chapter I make observations because before we get into arguments, in fact, I I don't really even see myself giving arguments. I really just see myself see uh, seeing if I can point to an analysis of observations. That's kind of, so we take a lot of time. So in the book, I make observations about myself and I invite the reader to make observations about themselves. And through these observations, I think you can become aware of your awareness of yourself. Mm. And that gives you knowledge of your knowledge. Would you say your methodology there is like phenomenology? Would you use that term? I don't like using any technical terms only because they're so loaded. Yeah. I talked about physicalism. They're so loaded, yeah. but that's a very, I think, perceptive um, connection there because yeah, what I'm doing would be what a lot of people would call phenomenology where you're paying attention to the, the phenomenology or what it's like uh, to have certain experiences. Uh, you're paying attention to contents of your consciousness and you're yeah. making observations there. And, and and we can even leave open whether they are contents of consciousness. You're just focusing on things yeah. like consider the thought. Right. That two plus two equals well, what is that? Who knows what that is? A considerate. Right. Yeah. And then you can begin to see, oh, that thought has properties. It has a property of aboutness. Okay. It has property of logical links. It has a property of being true. Okay. You're just yeah. focusing on it. And it's like, consider napkins on a table. Napkins on a table don't have aboutness. They don't have logical links. They don't have a property of being. Oh, the thought is not napkins. Same with uh, folds in a brain, right? Like the thought is not folds in a brain. It's like, well, what is it? Is it a functioning of a brain? No, because the function of the brain has different aspects. And you can sort of make, you can see this, you know, through these observations uh, or, you know, so I would argue, uh, but it all starts with phenomenology as, as you use the term. Yeah. Yeah. You're talking, you were just referencing intentionality as a feature of, of uh, like, propositional attitudes i guess mm -hmm. uh that some things seem to be about about yeah. things uh, they seem to be of yeah things and napkins don't seem to be about anything <laughs> right. so so it's just a physical physical objects don't seem to be about things. yes like not you, you intrinsic. Walk into a, not intrinsically okay yeah because right like you could maybe take the ad of the napkins and put them into a form of a map and you say hey look these napkins look like California. Right. Yeah, These yeah. napkins look like Arizona. Yeah. Now the napkins yeah. are about California. Okay? Right. But here's yeah. the problem with that is this isn't intrinsic aboutness because you need a key. The key tells you what represents what. Um, you know, we understand with our minds that if there are these certain shapes that they can represent maybe other shapes yeah. or even things that aren't even shapes at all, right? Because you get <laughs> right. thoughts about numbers or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, and that and that key, in a way, is um, a device that allows minds that can have basic intrinsic intentionality aboutness to decode the physical aboutness or the the aboutness in the map. So, the aboutness of the map yeah. drives its intentionality from a more basic intentionality of thoughts. Mm. And as as you're well aware, I mean, the right. big question is: can you de can you actually derive intrinsic, basic intentionality from like mindless bits of matter? Right. And a lot a lot of people would say you can't. I mean, e even those who call themselves materialists would say that this is a big challenge. We don't really see how to do that. Um, right. Alexander Rosenberg, for example, he argues that there just can't be intentionality out of physics, and since thoughts are about things, there can't be thoughts. Um, so I love that sort of style of argument because he's drawing out logical implications of a view that from fundamental physics, you can't derive intentionality. And so then you can't have thoughts and, you know, which, is, which would be an absurd. Well, is he, if, is that a reductio ad absurdum? Depends on, on your view. So in my view, right. In my view, I think that I can witness thoughts in my own mind and I can witness the that would be my view too yeah so I have that view I have the view <laughs> the view is thought. part of my mind yeah exactly <laughs> um so I do think that there are thoughts and um that they're real yeah. and that yeah. they have this sort of character that they appear to have in first person experience and I also agree with Rosenberg's argument uh I find it quite plausible that 
you can't generate thoughts just out of mindless grains of reality. Right. And so I just take the conclusion the other direction that fundamental reality isn't just mindless grains. Let me just say say kind of what you said in a, a slightly different way, just in yeah. case uh, people feel like maybe they're hanging on here for dear life. The, when you pay attention to what a thought is, it seems like they're about something. And that is a feature of the thought or any thought. If it's a legit thought, right? And beliefs as well. And, you know, maybe even perceptions, I guess. They're of or about things. And when you think of physical objects, it doesn't matter how big or small, just the physical object doesn't have that same feature of aboutness, which people, which philosophers call intentionality. That's kind of the property, I guess we're talking about. Would you say that's a fair characterization? So yeah, far? it's okay. beautiful. Yeah. So if, if, if the thoughts, the mental states here don't have, or do have this property and the physical objects don't, then there's a rule that they can't be the same thing. Yeah, because if they're the same thing, they have all and only the same properties like Superman and Clark Kent have all, all and only the same properties. Yeah, uh, there's only one guy there, Superman. Uh, sometimes he goes by Clark Kent. If he takes his glasses off, he's uh, Superman and no one can recognize him for some reason. I, w I never I've never <laughs> understood that about the story because it's not like when I come home and, and if I'm doing this with my wife, my wife doesn't go, who the hell are you? And I go, honey, wait, hold, hold on. Does this help putting my glasses back on? <laughs> oh, thank God. Thank God. Like Lois Lane, what is her issue? You know, seriously, it's the same guy. I, I was standing up at five years old. I saw it in the theater. I was like, it's the same guy. <laughs> yeah, It's the same freaking guy. Everybody in the theater could see, and it's only Lois. Anyway, <laughs> I'm talking about the original Superman. Okay, everybody. Not these crazy things that um, people come up with now, but I'm talking about the original Star Wars, the originals. Now I'm just going to go off on a tirade for like 20 minutes on <laughs> how Hollywood is just going down the drain. But so now that's a that's an argument against strict identity, I guess, for mental and physical states. But the physicalists always try to get around that somehow by, you know, they have different strategies or somehow yeah. making the mind some kind of feature of nature, right? Yeah, there, there's different ways of, of um, defending the sort of identity thesis, maybe by understanding two different concepts that mm -hmm. describe the same reality, kind of like the Clark Kent and Superman, right? Um, you know, Lois gets confused. She thinks they're different. Uh, they're actually the same reality. Maybe we're sort of confused in the same way that she's confused. Um, yeah. But I, I kind of like how you were playfully drawing out her confusion because, I mean, if you make some more observations, you could sort of uh, relieve your confusion, you know, by yeah. just being, okay, well, I, I don't really actually see that they have different features because even if I see this guy with glasses, I could imagine that the guy with the glasses could take off the glasses. Yeah. The glasses aren't essential to the guy. Mm -hmm. Whereas the aboutness of a thought is essential to the thought. You can't just take off the aboutness like you yeah. can take off glasses. Yeah. Um, and I so, like that, yeah. so I think once you make more observations, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it seems to me just manifest that just as I could sort of see that uh, a blue square is not the same as the number six or that mm -hmm. true is not the same as false. I think I can actually sort yeah. of see these things by direct awareness. Um, in fact, I, I kind of like this argument. Yeah, that, yeah. That either, either I can directly compare. So in my book, I, I talk about this direct comparison test where you can directly compare some items in your mind and see if they're different. So if you have the number two and the number three in your mind, you compare them directly and see that they're different. That's why you, you don't really get confused about like, you know, squares and triangles. Are they the same thing? Maybe it's like Clark Kent and Superman or water and H2O. Right. Like a square just is a circle or yeah, yeah. it's like, well, no, you, you can see by direct comparison. So, so I say, Either you can directly compare the aboutness of a thought with napkins or neurons or uh, Neptune or uh, nickels, you know, 
the number <laughs> two, just going with alliteration. Yeah, yeah. Either you can directly compare them, in which case you can sort of verify their distinction directly mm. by seeing them, or you can't directly compare them. And then here's the cool trick here. It's not, not a trick, but it's it's a, an additional path. Um, the, the trick is to see the, the path is that if you can't directly compare the aboutness of a thought with, let's just say, the napkins, then there's also another path to see that they're different because the thought is an object of direct awareness. You can see it within your own mind. Whereas if you're not directly comparing the app napkins, that must be because your theory of perception is that the napkins aren't direct objects of your perception. Maybe you're aware of some sense datum or some appearance of the napkins in your mind, but you're not aware of the napkins like as they are. They're external to your conscious awareness. Mm -hmm. The napkins are. Right. And they're causing the internal experience. It's like, okay, well, then that means that that which is internal, your thoughts, your experiences, can't be the same as that which is not internal, that which is external to avoid right. the contradiction. So either way, whether you can directly compare them or you can't directly compare them, I think that there's a way of sort of verifying a distinction there. Yeah, yeah. That makes yeah. a lot of sense. Yeah. To me, anyway. Um, yeah. I think you were kind of unpacking this in a in your own terms, and I, I don't want to cut you off from that if you wanted to keep doing that. Oh, no, no, no. I'm I'm having a lot of fun just, just uh, going back and forth here. Um, yeah. You know, it's... Uh, my only agenda really here is just to hang out with Josh and, and, and I think it's fun to just ask you what you think about things. Um, yeah, thank you. Like you've done so much hard work on this. Um, I, I'll just share a, a warm anecdote from my memories of you as we were colleagues and, and fellow students in a graduate program in philosophy at Biola back in the early two thousands. And, um, my memory of you is um, in class, you would you would just sit there and you would never take notes. And I, I was like frantically taking notes. I was like running out of paper and taking notes on my arm. So everybody ha thought I had tattoos and I was like some gang member. I was, you know, tattoos on my I was taking notes on my neck, you know, so it looked like I had. See, this, this, just out this, of jail. This is what I mean. This instinct that you have to create funny things out of things. I just love that about you. You've always done that. It's great. I can't help it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. But I remember just looking at you like, what is it like to be Josh? Like, because he is just taking all this in. And I know you were taking a full load too. Like, I remember you were like, yeah, I'm taking like 18 classes or something like that and i was like whoa i didn't even know you could take that many classes and he's like yeah you were like yeah i'm taking my entire degree this semester um and and uh isn't that true you never took any notes did you ever take notes did, I what just wasn't helpful to you i found it i remember that i remember feeling like i was very interested in the ideas and i was taking these mental notes in my mind and then there would be some things that were harder for me to remember and it, like the name of a person. And I would write that down. Okay. I would find that I would like learn more if I took fewer notes. Yeah. So I'd have like yeah. a few little lines <clears throat> and that seemed to help me. And I think I also noticed that I would have such an extreme interest Yeah, I was thinking about this recently because um, it seems like I'm very inept when it comes to remembering where things are in the material world. Uh, I'd lose track of things and Rachel knows where everything's at. So it's like, Rachel, where did I put this? And she used to say to me, she's like, Josh, like, why would I know where your things are? But then she would know where they are. So mm. she doesn't say that anymore. <laughs> I'm just like, well, where is this? Uh, That's cute. Well, it used to be over here and there was like a time log. So she knows where everything is at every moment. Right. So, and then there's a, you know, probability space that it goes over here. Cause that's your pattern, you know, so it's like, oh, yeah, thank yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't know that that's definitely a problem I have, but when it comes to um, the kind of idea landscape, mm. I'm sort of obsessively interested in it. Like it, it creates such excitement in my mind that yeah. it's, I don't know. It reminds me of maybe these chess players, like that they remember all these games and I don't understand how can you remember the board position from 10 years ago? But like when it comes to ideas, yeah, it's just, I find them so interesting that I, I do like, I remember. I mean, look, I, I remember a conversation you and I were having about the Kalam argument 
And I remember the details of the conversation. I remember oh, wow. um, your version of the Kalam argument, how it was different from Craig's. Uh, I had to do with laws and explaining them. And, and I just remember that. And it, it's like, I think because <laughs> it's just interesting to me. I don't know. Yeah, I can't, yeah, yeah. But That's a good well. example. I, I probably should add that because, because I see my students now, um, my students are taking notes on computers and sometimes they have their phones out, which I don't like. Um, but when I say that Josh was not taking notes, I, I probably should give a fuller picture here because this is like, okay, think 2002, you were there in 2002, right? You think? Yeah. And we used okay. paper back then. Ish that, yeah. There was no cell phone out. Right. No computer out. It was Josh sitting there totally engrossed eye contact with the professor the entire time. Uh -huh. And if somebody asked a question, maybe, you know, I, I contact that. But what I mean to say is you were totally engaged, not like any student I ever see now. I never see students like that now. Mm -hmm. They're always looking down at their laptops. Um, and I don't like laptops in the classroom. Do you let, do you allow laptops in the classroom? I do. I, I just yeah. say, you guys are free. I'm here to serve you. you yeah, can yeah. Do what you want. It's a good way to put it. Yeah. 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 And it takes the pressure off. It makes the relationship less ad adversarial. Yeah. I, I used to just really throw a fit because I just thought there was some kind of, there was, there had to be some room for professors to throw fits sometimes. Because yeah. Yeah. Who else is going to do it? I mean, these people, these kids don't know anything, but I don't do that anymore. I just kind of, yeah. but it's kind of sad to me mm -hmm. that they don't know what I know. They don't know the way it used to be. Uh huh. They don't you know how it used to be the art and science of taking notes with by hand. And I think it requires a little bit more careful listening. Well, maybe this is like, you know, when the calculator came out and all the parents are like, oh, we had to use the slide rules. The abacus. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You got well, it. Well, there's lots more going on on the computer. I think there's possibility for more going on. Anyway. That's it. Yeah. Um, then like uh, if I had connections in Canada and New Zealand and you know, pictures to look at on my notepad, I would probably be a little bit more skeptical about the notepad. But um, mm -hmm. so uh, when you, what kind of classes do you teach? I do intro to philosophy, which is a lot of fun. We go through the topics and you're taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, uh, I'm actually just scrolling through my newsfeed here. Uh, okay. Looks like there's, oh, my, look at my, what my Irish friend said. My, oh, this is hilarious. They just had an anniversary. Just kidding. I'm taking notes. I'm taking notes on a notepad. I forgot. I got to remember that some people are listening to this on Apple podcasts, so they can't see. I have mm -hmm. a notepad here and I'm taking notes by pen and it's very old school. I like it. I, I, I do this by the way, Josh, because first of all, I like it and it helps me remember what, what's said later yeah. when I describe the video. Because I tried to describe it accurately and well, like almost because I think it, this is this is a record in a library that can be accessed for decades. Mm -hmm. And the further away we get from the record production, uh, the less obvious it is what it is. So the reason I describe the videos very mm -hmm. carefully is because mm -hmm. it's it's really an archive, and I've worked in the archives. <laughs> I um. Yeah, one of my PhD uh, methodology research methodologies was archival methods, and um, it, uh, the professor was a professional historian, and we this was at Claremont, and we had to work in the special collections unit at Claremont, and I had to process an archive. So in other words, I was part of actually creating a collection at Claremont Special Collections. Mm -hmm. My handwriting is on the folders in those boxes. And um, the collection was from a, a, church, a very famous church in Los Angeles that is basically dead now. But we had all their materials since the turn of the century. And... Uh, I'm talking about board meeting notes, deacon material, flyers, Sunday school lessons, budget issues. 
some of the stuff you can't really, it's hard to figure out how to say what it is, but you, you have to come up with something because, yeah. because for a researcher to, to look into this later, they're going to just go by what you said, because they don't have time to look through everything. That's, it took me a long time to do it, you know? So, yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So anyway, so I, the way I take notes in the, uh, the sessions that we're having now is, is also to model it for any students that are watching this. Mm -hmm. And I want them to see that it's a, it's legit. You know, if you need to take notes, that's fine. You can do that. Cause, um, but in a way it's kind of honoring to whoever it is presenting. You know, I also do it for that reason as well, mm -hmm. because I want you to know I'm paying close attention to what you're saying and what you're saying is valuable. Mm -hmm. it's and, very kind. Um, well, I have to say, I've noticed when speakers would give a presentation um, at, at a kind of conference where somebody then asks questions at the end, if mm -hmm. the speaker takes notes uh, mm -hmm. in response to the questioner, that also really honors the questioner. And I've yeah. seen that's very attractive. So I've noticed that too. Yeah. yeah. So you, you teach uh, a topical approach there? Yeah, where I do. do. You teach? Where do you teach? At Azusa Pacific University. I've heard of that school. Yeah, somewhere in, in the that state school. that we're in. Yeah, that I've actually heard of that school. Yeah. Yeah, Azusa Pacific. They have a corner on the letters APU, and Biola doesn't have that distinction. <laughs> Biola yeah. can't say BU, and people don't know. They don't know what they're what Boston University. What are you talking about? And in that respect, we win because, you know, That's there's right. rivalry between the, the schools. That's right. That corner. Right. Yeah. So you teach a topical approach. You could teach a historical approach. Why don't I do, do bring in? I, I bring in historical figures that are relevant to the topic. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's just kind of how I enjoy it the most. And I always tell people lean into what you enjoy the most because you'll actually give the most value to others. I I believe that um, because you're stronger at your pleasures. So I do the topics because that's just how I, I like to think about it. Um, yeah. But we do bring in the historical figures that are relevant to the topics. I think I like the historic or the uh, topical approach myself. Yeah. I, I would say that that's, that's the method that Biola used. Mm -hmm. um, that's true. And it can feel a little disorienting when you get into a history type program, which I'm guessing Notre Dame was not a history type program. Not in the track that I was in. No, it's very, okay. very topical. Yeah. So you probably fit in like a fish in water. So, yeah, but like if you're doing the, his, if you all of a sudden you now need to know all the history, it might be a little disorienting because you're, that's not how you were introduced to philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the historical approach seems to be really meaty in in ways that the topical approach isn't, but um but then how do you know you're interested in it unless you first got to the topics? Like, you know, it seems like that's yeah. how you get, know you are interested in the thing. You know I mean? It's like, that's when the questions become yours. Mm -hmm. Right. Don't you? Think? I think I do. I think they both can kind of go together, but yeah, yeah. if you're interested in philosophy, I think there have to be some questions and topics that grab your attention. What was it for, for you? What was the first topic that got you interested in? Well, I think this was before I even knew there was even such a field as philosophy. And I was um, just thinking a lot about whether the world is uh, a safe place to be. Um, mm. If atoms are the rulers and atoms eventually destroy my body and I'm gone, uh, the world doesn't seem so safe. If beneath the atoms, there's maybe something greater, maybe something that is not just mindless, um, that could provide more resources for safety. And for me, it was just this realization that truth might not be what I want it to be. And that led me Whoa. to become curious, like, well, what is reality? You know, what, what is true about actual reality? Uh, I had this picture of a wave of water. The wave of water represents reality. And then my desire would be represented by me trying to put the wave into a place and like holding it there. And it's like, why well, I don't have that power to make reality what it is most fundamentally. It just is what it is. And that like, it kind of shook me because I realized I can't just assume that, you know, beliefs that my parents had or my community had or something are true. 
Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, what is this world that we're in? And so that led me into reading books by uh, various atheist philosophers, uh, J.L. Mackey, Kai Nielsen, um, uh, Michael Martin, uh, Quentin Smith, other other non-theist philosophers at the at the top of the field, um, developing arguments against the existence of God at a level of sophistication that is widely regarded to be kind of the most rigorous. And then I was reading those books alongside other books like uh, William Rowe. Well, he's actually not coming at it from a theistic perspective, but he's got a book on the cosmological argument where through his pathway of reasoning, and not a lot of people realize this about Rowe, at the end of that book, he says that this argument can provide a reason to think that God is real. Um, mm. And so then there were other books like this, and, and I'm working on the arguments in my own mind and just thinking, okay, what, what's actually true? So that was kind of the first thing that opened the door to yeah, philosophy. Yeah. yeah. So it was philosophy of religion. Did you grow up religious? Yeah, my parents um, are... Uh, raised me in a, a Christian home. And uh, so that was kind of my background. And I think that's kind of part of what helps me to really understand and appreciate what it feels like to be raised in a certain culture or context, and then to question it, and then to sort of exit it, uh, in a sense of like, seeing it from the outside. Um, and then for me, the search to truth led me to this kind of increasing awareness that reality is bigger and greater than I had imagined, bigger and greater mm -hmm. than I imagined. And, and I would say this with some conviction, like I, I do believe in God is real. Um, I think God is, is bigger than any particular religion. He, he doesn't, he's not limited to the confines that human beings have kind of put him into. It isn't to say that all perspectives are equal or all thoughts right. about God are the same. It's just to say that I think sometimes we do sort of limit God to I don't know, like a box that makes sense to us and God doesn't really fit into to our boxes very well. Do you believe uh, like the classic Christian doctrines uh, like which Trinity, one Trinity? So I do think that God is uh, can be characterized in a triune way. Um, mm -hmm. But I leave open different models for how you could characterize God in a triune way. I think my my current working model is that God the sort of source of reality is able to manifest itself in different forms and can do that simultaneously. And so in that way can be presented in a triune way. Um, so, you know, I would affirm that, but do I don't use think... the term person. When we talk about tripersonal active being uh, mm -hmm. that created the world, sustains it in existence. That's a classical, you know, we'll judge it at the end of time. Yeah. Um, the, the doctrine of Trinity where, God, there's one God, right? Got to say that <laughs> it's monotheism, but three persons. It's it's a little. It, it sounds a little odd. Um, it, it, do we have a univocal definition of person between us, like as persons, and God in that sense? So I'm not really sure, um, and I also hesitate to use the word we because probably different people have different notions, even in their own minds. <laughs> But well, well I'm just... referring to myself, me, myself, and I. Yeah. Okay. Well, you said we, so I was like, what's in your three, mind? Three. <laughs> okay. Right. Right. Me, the, myself, and the I. Trinity of you. Uh right. The plural uh we. Um I I have the, the royal we. Yeah. Gosh, that's the it. Royal we. Royal. I um have so I, I used to like the sort of social trinitarian model where there's three centers of consciousness that are like foundational. Um, but I've transitioned kind of away from that because I think that the foundation of the foundation is, uh, has to be more singular than that. Mm. Otherwise I'm wondering like, well, why three? I think there's gotta be some deeper explanation. Right. And also, even if you look at classic historic, uh, Christian views, there's always been this model of a, a God as having a kind of hierarchy of, of relations so that you have the source consciousness or God, the father being yeah. a certain way ontologically prior to the other personas. Um, so I've been kind of thinking about that Latin school where they emphasize the unity and that term persona can mean like face, like you got like three different faces or forms mm -hmm. of God. Um, and they're like windows into the 
fundamental consciousness that can be sort of accessed in different ways. And yeah, I think yeah. also I've been thinking of it maybe even metaphorically a little bit that for us in our limitation, it's helpful to have images of God that relate to us. But yeah. I mean, I've been thinking like if, if we were butterflies and God became incarnate as a butterfly or something to show <laughs> us some properties of himself, we could only help, we, we could not help, but think of God through sort of our butterfly lens. Yeah. And so I've been thinking about that even in terms of the personas of God, that we think of person in a way that relates to our human yeah. experience. Right. And that God in his goodness and grace can <laughs> become incarnate, take on human form, show himself in our way um, that we can understand. But I think there's a danger if we limit God to the manifestations of God as we understand God in our own minds. I, I feel like if we can think of those manifestations as windows into a deeper reality, then um, that's helpful. So that's kind of where I'm at on, on that topic. Um, I, I came across a video you did with uh, the Pints with Aquinas guy. Oh, yeah. Um, on the ontological argument. I don't know how that came up. on It came up as a recommended thing. So I was like, oh, hey, I know that guy. Um, do you think that I didn't watch the whole thing? I only watched about half of it. Um, but uh, the greatest conceivable being as evidence for God's existence, like the concept, the mm -hmm. greatest conceivable being as evidence for God's existence. Do you think that that's a legit argument? For God? I think that's a very difficult argument to yeah. draw out. Now, my hesitation comes from sort of recent explorations of a certain strategy that comes from Kurt Goodall. Are you familiar with Goodall's ontological argument? No. So let, let me just start by affirming kind of the worry is that you can't derive from the mere existence of a concept, um, the actual application of that concept. To right. reality. For example, right. you have a concept of a unicorn and you can't just say just because the concept of a unicorn exists, there really is a unicorn. And there is yeah. this feeling that in principle, you can't derive reality from concept. Yeah. And so any kind of argument that tries to do that has to be a problematic argument. Even if we don't know where the problem is, it's got to be some kind of trick. Mm. So that's the first thing. And then the second reason for resistance is um, a little bit of a social reason, which is that like I'm a human being and I, and I recognize that if I say, oh, I like the ontological argument, that's like the one argument that even theists who like arguments for God's existence will be skeptical of. And if I like that argument, then it it, it makes it seem like I'm too eager to like every argument for theism. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, that's okay. I'm 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 willing to come across that way for sake of <laughs> intellectual honesty. So I just have to say that in the last five years or so, and especially maybe in the last two years, I've been intrigued with a certain Godelian ontological argument that follows a, a certain specific step-by-step -step pathway that goes from the concept of God to a kind of being that uh, I'm not going to draw up the argument now. Maybe we could put a link to the description or something. Sure. I, gave, I gave a talk on this um, kind of argument. And at the beginning of the talk, this is maybe one of the more important points I want to make, is I addressed that worry that you can't derive the existence from a concept. So in the case of unicorns, I don't think right. the existence of the concept entails that there is a unicorn okay i don't think that no uh, we, we agree on that but uh, but but consider the concept of being a concept could the concept of being a concept exist if there are no concepts i don't think so it couldn't okay right because the concept of being a concept is itself a concept yeah so if it exists right, right, right. then what it's about also exists yeah so that that basically is a counterexample to the general Mm. hypothesis that you can never in principle derive reality from concept yeah now people listening to this will say but wait 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 the concept of concept that's very different from the concept of god okay fair enough obviously it's very different but all i'm doing sure. is just addressing the in principle worry that in principle we we have to shut the door to this kind of argument yeah. because you can't derive reality from concept that's too strong the door is open let's see rephrase let, yeah, let, let's see. Is there something about the concept of God that yeah. points to a kind of being 
that would be too great to not possibly exist. And so Godel has this, this yeah, strategy yeah. for unpacking that argument. And, you know, I'm, I'm intrigued by that type of argument. Um, seems like it's, it's promising. There, there might be a pathway there. I think for me personally, I think that it's more helpful to think of that argument almost in connection with a web of other considerations. So the ontological arguments maybe help to unpack the nature of God, if there is a God. Yeah, uh, but I then agree causal, with that. Causal-based yeah. arguments or explanation-based arguments can then give you some reason to think that this nature is actually instantiated. Yeah, in, yeah. Um, something like that. So oh, That's very insightful. Yeah, I like that. I think that um, I, I, when I teach the ontological argument, I, I that's... Um, that's uh, something I try to get across is, you know, we have to kind of define what we're, what we're talking about. Like we're talking yeah. about God. Well, what do you mean by God? Mm -hmm. It does seem like God is the greatest conceivable being. I mean, you could start with something a little bit more pedestrian. Like I, I start with geese and I, I, I start with, cause I actually heard a sermon one time, which said that God was the geese. And, okay. uh, and, uh, I think it was a Unitarian or something. I, I, it was one of those non-Orthodox churches that mm -hmm. was trying to keep members still where they would not really quote the Bible. They would just like quote poetry and they would call it a church. I like how you said non-Orthodox. I thought maybe you were going to use the, the, that word that you like so much liberal. It's one of those, <laughs> yeah. Is that oh, word they that were definitely, follow. I could definitely tell, predict what political party this church was. Okay. Um, it's a, it's fascinating correlation. Mm -hmm. um it's, it's funny it, people act like there's no correlation there but it's just like the mirror walking by the mirror that's probably me mm -hmm. well anyway um so uh we were i was you know reading this and uh i had the transcript of the sermon and i used it in my class so we talked about properties of geese and and, um, you know, the fact that you can kill geese <laughs> and, and, uh, it doesn't seem like you can kill God though. I mean, anyway, in the case, it, 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 at least atheists believe geese exists and a definition of an atheist is somebody who doesn't believe God exists. Yeah. So. Most, most atheists. Right? Yeah. But most, atheists. there are some skeptics of organized holes, right? So just probably cover all that's the probably, faith. That's a, that's a useful yeah, I, I actually was at a, at a talk where a philosopher um, argued against our existence based on the uh, non-existence of organized holes. So mm -hmm. he would question the existence of geese, uh, not because of atheism in particular, but, right, but you right, could right, be an right. atheist. And sure. Anyway, keep, keep yeah, going. Yeah, yeah, Sorry, yeah, don't, yeah. don't mind me over here. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's. But but an atheist does seem to reject that the greatest conceivable being exists. Yeah. And I affirm that it does as a theist. And that seems to be a pretty good explanation for at least a rough and ready explanation for what God God's nature is, at least mm -hmm. what I mean by it. So it would be very interesting to me if that very nature, the concept of it, yeah. There's evidence that God existed and yeah. it would be kind of, it would kind of fit with a view of God where he, he wants to be found mm -hmm. by people, he wants to be people to be able to find him easily. Yeah. Um, Maybe by many different means. My, by very, yeah. Right. What's your favorite argument for God's existence? Well, it kind of depends. Um, but I would say that right now. Depends on your mood. So much. <laughs> yeah. It depends on kind of my mood and maybe. Who how much I'm coffee you've had with yeah how hyper i am and um what i'm thinking about but i just have to say like i'll watch my kids play with their toys and i'm mm -hmm. thinking about consciousness so i i bug them with these questions like you know if you put those legos if you make that lego tower a little bigger will those legos collectively start feeling sad you know they say no and then i ask them well, how do you know like, you know it doesn't have a mouth they couldn't tell you mm -hmm. You know, and in so many words, they tell me that Legos just can't do that sort of a thing. <laughs> they just, mm -hmm. they know that. And I think they know that by insight into the nature of uh, what they're working with there. Um, that, that That's where I think that I, I have a hypothesis about how they know. I think they know without knowing how they know. But yeah, um, 
I think the way they know is through insight into the natures. And so I would say this kind of argument from constructing personal beings who can mm-hmm. think, feel, and have conversations like this, constructing us out of just mindless grains of matter. Um, when I think about that from many different angles, that kind of a argument from construction. See, some arguments when I look at them more closely, including arguments for conclusions I might independently think are true, they sort of fall apart under scrutiny. Um, Whereas this argument has only just increased in its sort of strength in my mind. So even though I'm, I'm sort of known for my work on contingency arguments and people might expect me to say, oh, this argument from cause and contingent things in terms of a necessary supreme foundation, that kind of argument from contingency, you know, addressing the question of why there's anything Mm. uh, that's, I'm kind of known for that argument, but maybe the argument that, that really actually clicks and really grips me the most. I mean, that, that argument does click in my mind, but yeah, something about getting sand to just blow in the wind and then organize into a conscious being that Mm. just, the, the problem of, of explaining that on so many levels, the not, not just in principle, how is that possible, but just the probabilistic resources for explaining why mindless grains of reality would somehow be biased in a way to come into the sort of fine-tuned conditions for universe to produce a sphere where people start emerging after time, right? And I've done work on evolution simulations through computer models that create little replicators and they go on forever and ever and ever forever and mm. never are able to produce anything that is interesting or, or, or complicated at all. I mean, I've personally created these programs and run them and made observations. And so I think it's widely acknowledged that in order to get complex life forms, there's a sequence of fine-tuned conditions. But then yeah. when it comes to minds, beings right. that can have aboutness Right. You're not going to get that by assembling Legos or napkins or um, atoms. It just, it's, it's not probably going to happen. And I don't think even yeah. going to happen. Yeah, yeah. So that, that might be my, my so favorite. would you call that the argument from consciousness? You could call it that, or maybe the argument from persons. It's a little more from persons. Okay. Yeah. From broad, it's broader because what's a person. Like, so let's say a person is the kind of being that you and I are. We can leave open how we define that because okay. it's dangerous waters to give a definition of a person. But whatever we are, uh, we qualify as persons. And then we have all these interesting properties. So we have the property of being able to think, the property of being able to feel, the property of being able to think rationally, mm. follow tracks of reason in our mind. We can do that. The property of being able to feel that we've done something good or something wrong, that feeling mm-hmm. there. Uh, it's a specific kind of consciousness. See, it's not just yeah, It's not just dogs. Feelings. Dogs can't have the, yeah. you're right. distinguished from dogs, right? Yeah, there, there's a kind of sense. I mean, I don't know, dogs, people tell me their dogs do sometimes exhibit signs of feeling ashamed, but there's, there's something more specific than that, that we have mm-hmm. uh, that dogs don't seem to have. Yeah. And, and so what explains that? And um, I think you could set this up, you know, if fundamental reality is mindless and impersonal, probably there would be no persons, you know, yeah. at least probably there'd be no persons. Um, there are persons. Uh, right. Well, I guess because I put it in terms of probability, I guess what well, we should just simplify. So if fundamental yeah. reality is mindless and impersonal, there would be no persons. There are persons. Therefore, fundamental reality is not mindless and impersonal. And then you support that first premise that if reality is mindless and impersonal kind of in the Alexander Rosenberg way where you Mm -hmm. appeal to what we know from physics and make the case that you can't construct persons (laughs) with all the properties we would have if we were real out of those mindless bits. Right. Um, And so then it's that second premise. Why I think there are persons, why I think we're real, why I think they really are us. And then I think we just witness our own reality from within. Like when we have a dream, we are aware of ourselves and, um, so that that kind of argument, yeah, I'd say that that's a very interesting argument that, to me. That, I mean, that's a nice description of of our ordinary experience. Um, yeah. Even how you know, pronouns are all the rage now, but just think of the first and second 
personal pronouns, when I'm walking through, uh, for example, the church spaces in the sanctuary, I, I don't, um, I don't ever address if a chair is out of place and by I'm my part of my job at the church is I'm on staff at the church is, is to or, or make sure the sanctuary is, is ready mm -hmm. for the service. So the, if a chair is out of place, I don't, say in a, any serious way i don't address the chair as you right i i i don't even address the chair at all actually but mm -hmm. um i mean if i was joking i might say uh where, how did you get there yeah what are you doing over there right now if my experience was that the the chair walked back over to where it was supposed to be and um exhibited some other behavior just like you're your kids if they were putting those things together those building blocks and mm -hmm. after a certain level of complication the the building block started walking around and yeah maybe uh crying or something <laughs> then yeah. then or uh, look you know ex producing uh some kind of substance and sounds yeah. and stuff like that i'm i'm alive then they they would have a and if that was the uniform experience that they had uh then they would have maybe different assumptions, but yeah, it seems like our, our, there is a very clear difference between ordinary physical objects like that are visible to the naked eye and, uh, the kind of objects that you and I are. And, and it doesn't seem like there's anything physical that can account for that. Is if fair to physical, say? yeah. I mean, again, that term physical. There's electrical stuff going on up here that's not yeah. going on in the chair, but. Yeah, uh, so one, one sort of idea is that, well, maybe if you get matter arranged in a spatial way, I, I tend to think of physical in terms of implying spatiality. Yeah. So it's physical if it has some kind of spatial connection. So like mm -hmm. a chair is physical, um, yeah. dark, dark gray matter in a brain is physical. Yeah. And yeah. and so, you know, somebody might say, well, when, once you get the physical stuff put to the right way, then yes. it starts acting conscious. Right. And this is maybe evidence that consciousness sort of depends on certain kinds of physical arrangements. Yeah. Napkins and chairs, that's not enough. Um, but if we get neurons sort of arranged in the right way, then we get the the consciousness emerging from there. Um, so, uh, well, people think yeah. that because they they that's part of the experience i think is yeah just describing that there is something that humans have that the chair doesn't have a brain and a central nervous system and there's there's properties of that yes that, that that's missing in the chair example or the lego example and it's present to some extent in like an elephant or something yeah. um or a donkey not to bring this back to politics but but you know like or lizard or something like that mm. um so what do you or say about that? I mean, that's. Yeah, a couple things about that. Um, so first, I think we have information from introspective awareness of thoughts and feelings that gives us sort of like inside data that we don't have about just looking at a chair um, or even a brain, right? So I think that one way that you can make this argument, going back to this argument for distinction based on direct awareness, I think we can be directly aware of thoughts having aboutness. Uh, we can direct, be aware of feelings. And then we are also aware of the connection between thoughts and feelings and certain structures in a brain. And I think that that awareness of those connections doesn't show by itself that those thoughts and feelings just are brain states, that they're the same thing, but that there's this deep correlation and connection. And then, then there's a question, well, what's the nature of the connection? But just yeah. to illustrate, because I think it's so important to get clear that you can have a deep connection between things, even if they're not like the same thing. So for example, yeah. I, I yeah. could be reading a book and as I'm turning the pages of the book, I'm experiencing consciously mental imagery um, ideas in my mind related to the materials in the book. Okay. Now somebody takes that book and while I'm reading it, they begin to rip pages and wrinkle them up okay now they're they're changing the book that i'm reading and it's affecting my consciousness it's affecting 
even what I'm able to think about because yeah. the book was acting as a device yeah. for my own conscious experience. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if somebody says, oh, this shows that your consciousness just is the book, just is those pages. And if we yeah. destroy the whole book and burn it in a fire, you'll be gone. Gone. Yeah. You won't be able to think. And it's like, well, no, that doesn't actually follow. In fact, right. I would make the argument that I know I'm not that book mm. by my own awareness of my own consciousness that is different from the pages of the book. Okay. Yeah. So then the qu next question. So people listening or watching might be wondering, well, what is the connection then between a functioning brain and consciousness? Sometimes yeah. people ask me like, well, why even have a brain? Mm. And there, there's this scientist, his name is Kysik, uh, C-I-S-E-K. And he's a, a brilliant guy. He works in the sciences and he has this control model of the brain. And I think his control model of the brain, uh, and he's not coming at this, by the way, from a religious perspective or a theist perspective, purely just mm. sort of following the scientific evidence. And, and, and he thinks of the brain as acting as a control device for our interaction with the environment. Right. And so I like that model. That, that makes sense to me. Just like the book is a kind of device for having certain kinds of conscious experiences. I think our brain is a very sophisticated kind of like algorithm for having conscious experiences in this world. And now, now there's this deeper question about, well, why is there even any kind of correlation between, uh, why is there any kind of systematic law-like connection between kind of brain stuff and mental experiences? And to my mind, this pushes this question into the sort of the nature of the reality we're in. What kind of a reality yeah. would be able to, right. let alone probably result in this kind of sophisticated interplay where we can have experiences through a control system like the brain. And mm -hmm. some philosophers, so there, there's two kinds of arguments here. So some philosophers have argued from probability that a mind at the foundation of reality better predicts the sort of probability of there being this kind of sophisticated environment where we can yeah. interact with each other in controlled ways. So the brain's doing something important, just like a book's doing something important for your experience. It's a controlled interaction. Um, you know, and, and then in, in near-death experiences, people sometimes have that report of experiences with where the book's put down in a sense. Uh, you know, the brain is offline and they're having experiences. And whether whatever you think of those experiences, whether they're vertical or not, the idea is that they point to this uh, mind-first, I like to call it mind-first theory of the world mm. that I think explains both how it's not so unlikely that there would be some kind of um, environment where conscious beings can have conversations and have controlled interactions with each other in orderly ways, not just in chaotic ways. First, the probability. And then there's that in principle construction problem. And here people might disagree with this, but I've become increasingly convinced of this, which is that just like you can't organize Legos to build a conscious being, you cannot in principle organize mindless matter to build mm. a person so that if you yeah. organize atoms into a brain and then the brain starts acting conscious, the full explanation is not merely in virtue of the mindless atoms organized. It's rather right. more like the book that the atoms organized in that way provide a device for a conscious being to then use that device. Mm -hmm. So it's not that the atoms produce the conscious being, the conscious being might have even produced that arrangement or maybe in cooperation with God produced the arrangement or maybe God just produces both. But in any case, you need something more than the mindless reality because of that, that in principle construction problem. Yeah. Yeah. And you either have a mind first type of a picture like that or not mind first. Right. I mean, it yeah. seems like there's only two mindless options. or mental. Yep. Yeah. Um, and, and, and defining mind in the, like kind of the ordinary way we would say, you don't even have to get that specific, just kind of like what you mean by your first person awareness. Yeah. Awareness. Um, I, I sort of define yeah. it the realm, the, 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 the place where there's contents of consciousness. So whether it's okay. thoughts, uh, I mean, we usually in normal language think of minds as the place where there's thinking, right. But right. philosophers of the mind include feelings as well. So 
So turn the mind. So yeah. is it fair to say that common sense features pretty heavily in your methodology? Um, it, it's it's almost as if you're. Um, it, it seems like everybody has to use common sense somehow because mm -hmm. you have to get off the ground talking to people. Yeah, and you have to have a point of connection, and so so if you go too far off the reservation of common sense. You just sound to start sound crazy. And what I love about your approach is it's very common sense friendly without just being completely subservient to it. That's like, it. You got it. Yeah. It's not subservient. So I don't start by saying, Oh, what, where does common sense lead us? I start right. with what are the clearest observations that I can make from my perspective? Yeah. So I observe thinking, I observe my hand moving. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm driving my daughter Lana to dance class and she says, daddy, don't miss the turn. It's coming up. And I tell her, okay, you know, it's coming up like in five seconds. So I say, mm -hmm. okay, Lana, like, how do I move my hands? I have to move the steering wheel. Oh, no. How do I do it? And she's like, you know how I just do it, do it. And I was like, okay, Lana, I'm going to do something in my mind. And I hope that doing this thing in my mind will result and these physical arms turning the steering wheel. That's hilarious. And I'm and then I'm kind of, you know, being playful, but I'm also yeah, yeah. verifying a deep philosophical truth, which is that our minds have the power to move our bodies. Wow. We witness this. It's like I witness myself yeah. forming an intention in my mind. And then I observe my hands following that intention. And there's this connection between those observations which I can explain in terms of probability link. The probable explanation is right. there's some causal connection between thinking and moving. Now, this is where it comes back. What it's to like to be sense. your kids, man. Because They're getting great philosophical training. As, I, I do. Kid. Yeah, they 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 do uh, kind of put up with my questions, but then they ask me questions in return, you know, so it's playful banter. Um, but but it's, then then what this does is I think the result is, oh, this actually looks pretty commonsensical. Yeah, I, I feel like my right. my support of common sense is a fruit of trying my best um, to just make the clearest observations by my lights and then inviting others to help me see what I'm missing. And that sort of right. method yeah. of help because I, I, I find dialogic wrong and then help help me see where I'm wrong. And then and I'm not just saying that. I mean, that I right. find that very helpful. And then I update my view and then that supports common sense um, in in general, but you know, sometimes common sense is misleading. So I'm not hostage to it. It's interesting. Um, all of a sudden, when you gave that example, I thought of the Christian doctrine of the, the, the incarnation and the immaculate conception. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that doctrine is true in the incarnation? I think I like the virgin birth in, into a human form. And I think there's a way of understanding that entry into human form where it's not through normal means. Yeah. Um, so, so you believe that's that true? Sense. I think that that is probably true. Okay. So God could just do something like that. Doesn't need people. Well, he used, God used uh, Mary, I guess, but the conception itself was kind of like you turning your hands on the wheel. Like you just said, I just yeah. want to do it. And so I do it, you know, yeah. I mean, it sounds almost like a miracle. Is it the same thing as a miracle when you turn your, your, Oh, well, what do you mean by the word miracle? I mean, um, directly causing something that was not there. There was no physical, uh, causal antecedent. Uh -huh. Yeah. Now, if we think of physical in terms of uh, purely or fundamentally spatial, then I would say that, yeah, that, that would qualify as a miracle in that sense, okay. uh, because it, it has a mental cause and that mental cause is not fundamentally characterized in terms of spatial relations. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing in the purely physical in terms of the spatial. The reason why I'm, I'm being very hesitant with the word physical is just because some philosophers have a wider meaning of the word. Yeah. Physical. So it includes non um, spatial and even mental, fundamentally mental okay. entities. But if we okay. restrict the notion to uh, fundamentally sort of spatial, then absolutely you, you could say that your own ability 
to move your hands. Yeah. It's a miracle in that Something sense. Something that we witness all the time. You're a first mover. You're actually, cha- you have the power to change reality from the ground up. It uh, does seem like that's what we mean by yeah. moral responsibility too. Like that's why we blame people. Seems like, or we hold them in high regard if they do something because yeah. we feel like they did it. They, they, that's it. Th- it wasn't caused by events in the remote past, ultimately by the big bang. <laughs> I mean, if you go all yeah. the way back, if, yeah. if that, if the big bang is true, but, um, but yeah, Not a uh, puppet of the vir- particles, right. The virgin birth has never been a, a problem for me to believe. I mean, I mean, this is different than what would serve as evidence for it. Like that's a different conversation, but. It opens the possibility. I understand what you're saying because yeah. somebody might object. Hey, you know what? Miracles are impossible. Right. Defined in precisely the way you defined it. But if mental causation is something we experience um, directly all the time, then it opens up. Hey, if there is a fundamental mind, why couldn't it enter the scenes in that same way? God created the world, the whole universe, right? <laughs> so what do you mean by reality? Just what? something. Okay. Something. Yeah, <laughs> it's something it can be anything. Just leave it open. Uh, so reality, just whatever there is, whatever it's, it's, there is. Okay. Yeah. If I could just add here on this note, because I think there there is something about the significance of some of the most familiar common sense observations that have very profound implications about the nature of what of reality of, of what's real of, of what exists. Um, and and one of them we we talked about is consciousness, but the other is that ability through our consciousness to make a difference in the world. It's so mm-hmm. familiar, so commonsensical. And many philosophers of mind who sort of follow the implications will then, I, I've heard philosophers describe mental causation as like magic or you know miracles in, in, right. in a, that you're describing. And that creates a reason to doubt that we have mental causation. Leading to, a weird thing to, say, to right, epiphenomenalism, right. which is the view that our minds are sort of causal foam on an ocean wave they don't really do anything and um and and i think that that just highlights the significance of what mental causation would imply because part of the argument is that reality is fundamentally mindless if reality is fundamentally mindless the mindless actors causally exclude the power of the mental to make any difference this is the causal exclusion problem and 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 I would argue the other way. There's good neuroscientific evidence uh, for mental causation, hmm. and I think it also fits our ordinary um, experiences. And I can offer some sources on that by ma- just mainstream neuro. This is not fringe neuroscience. This is mainstream recent neuroscience for the power of our minds to affect and even heal our brains and change our brains, uh, the neuroplasticity of our brains through our activities and in, in our consciousness. And so if there is a causal exclusion problem, I would just say, hey, that's one more problem for the mindless first theory of reality. It seems to me that that's how I would think about it. I really like uh, the way you put mind first versus mindless first reality, because when you focus the mind <laughs> that way, it it does. Uh, I think it's very helpful to to just see those two options. Yeah. And then pay attention to your own experience and your own direct experience of mind and your observations of the world. And, um, it, and then different ex- explanations and then people are trying to explain how people came about and what, what, um, okay. uh, in all of the various manifestations, how people came about. I'm as a political philosophy person and a constitutional law person, that's my specialty. I'm very interested in rights and yeah. responsibilities too, but um, I, they might be two sides of the same coin, I guess, duties and rights. Um, if, if, if uh, I have right, a certain right, then the, the government has a duty not to, uh, to violate that right. And, um, I think some, some rights that we have, uh, we have by nature and they're not, um, just by agreement, you know, they're not by (laughs) government recognition of my existence or, or anything like that. 
So uh, I'm very interested in philosophy of religion for that reason, because when you, when you, when you uh, pull back from the whole picture, how do you explain yeah. people and what they are and what kind of things are we? Yeah. We just yeah. come from some kind of mindless story that, uh, that has rights. <laughs> and how do you get a, a robust picture of rights? Like I feel like is common sense, I think. And it can explain why certain regimes are very evil. They all have certain features in, in common. And, um, and the disrespect of rights is, is one of them. So, um, you know, I, I'm very bothered by that. I'm very bothered by mm -hmm. these dark places in, in the world and the fact that certain places in the world could be dark and, and evil for decades and decades mm -hmm. and generations and generations. So there's like structures. Yeah. Oh, and it's yeah. worse if, if reality is mindless at its base, because then you can't really do anything about it. You just yeah. experience the waves of darkness yeah. Yeah. dictated by the mindless atoms. Right. Even in the present moment, it's the mindless atoms pulling the strings on your own feelings, thoughts, mm -hmm. and attitudes. So if you go and you violate my rights, you know, or whatever, you hurt me, you, you destroy my face, I might think, oh, you shouldn't have done that. But then mm -hmm. I realized, no, it's just mindless atoms making you mm -hmm. experience the intentions uh, making. E e and even if it's even because this is people miss this. This doesn't have to do with determinism. Even if reality is at base indeterministic. So there's forks in the road and the atoms just probabilistically go this way and that and that way. The point is, is if they are the, sp the string pullers, then you're not. Right. You're a me mental being and the mindless atoms are mindless. So if the mindless pulls the strings on what you do, then all the things that bother you in the political scene, it would bother you even more in the sense that you're completely powerless to do anything. Mm -hmm. But if you can actually recognize that you are not that kind of a being, that you actually have the power to affect the atoms by thinking a certain way, it can be a game changer. Then you can start having positive ripple effects that can begin to change society outward from your yeah. yeah 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 when when you think of the correspondence theory of truth um do you think that which is i think it's fair to say that the correspondence theory of truth is the common sense view would you say that's fair it's the common view um so maybe maybe that would be fair to say that yeah i feel like it's common sense to say yeah. that that a, a proposition is true if and only if uh, it corresponds to reality. Yeah. Is that I a think, fair right. way to yeah. say it? I think okay. so. Yeah. So and it's a necessary condition that it corresponds to reality and it's also a sufficient condition that it yeah. corresponds to reality. Okay. Yeah. So um, can truth be evidence for anything else like meaning in life or God's existence or anything like that? I think truth also provides like another challenge to the kind of purely mindless material view. Um, I talk about this briefly in my book. I've got a chapter on thoughts. And in that chapter, I identify aspects of thoughts. So I, I use that sort of introspective observation to witness in my own mind, my own thoughts. I invite the reader to do the same. <laughs> and then through this, I, I identify aboutness. We talked about that. Um, logical links, so and and or, these are conceptual links. These are very profound, by the way, that reality has given rise to logical links that that's, yeah. it, you know, napkins alone, you know, won't, won't do that. <laughs> the, the and, you know, the or of the, you know, that that's, that that's a very yeah. special thing inside thoughts. And then um, you're pointing to truth, right? That's another aspect of, you could think of it an aspect of the contents of thoughts. So yeah, if you yeah. have a thought that snow is white, I have a thought that snow is white. The content of our thought is that snow is white. And then it, it's true because it actually describes accurately in general, in rough terms, you know, the color of snow, Sometimes uh, unless, dirty. You, unless, you, unless you pee on it or, you know, you, yeah, you yeah. dirty, right? But you start, you start the car and then the snow next to the exhaust is brown. Yeah, right. Exactly. So you can change the color of the snow, but that's yeah. the whole point is that but it started out white. 
the reality is what sort of determines the truth of, yeah. of the of the content of the thought. Right. But that means that there can't be truth if there aren't these call them propositions. By proposition, I just hear me minimally the kind of thing that can be a content of a thought. Okay, that's mm -hmm. all I mean here. Yeah. And so we can leave open the nature of propositions, where they came from. But minimally, if there's truth, there are contents of thoughts, the kinds of things that can be true. Then yeah, I, I wonder right, right, right. how in the world would mindless grains of reality organize themselves into contents of thoughts? There's that in principle construction problem again. I'm not sure that it would be possible in principle to do that. In fact, I, I, I guess I feel kind of sure that it would be impossible to be very honest. <laughs> and then there's also the probability problem that I just wouldn't expect mindless grains of reality. There's nothing in the theory that there are mindless grains of grains of reality that would predict that any thoughts would ever emerge, let alone right. true thoughts, right? Right, yeah, yeah. But if instead the, the fabric of reality is fundamentally a, a, a mind or mental, then it has reasons, it has all the resources, re, the resources and I think reasons to make a reality that unfolds to produce um, beings that can have true thoughts. Um, so I think truth is one of those very familiar but yeah. profound metaphysical pieces of reality. And and I think it does yeah. break a kind of mindless material frame. At least it, it definitely challenges it in my mind. I, I'm going to link your YouTube channel because uh, what I love about your YouTube uh, approach is this exciting uh, method that you have of uh, this presence that you have where you take something that's ordinary and you say, let's look a little further. Yeah. Let's let's peer closely at that and let's examine that and slow down if we have to. And there, uh, it's a very effective way to teach philosophy. I think it's the right way. Can I ask you um, the the human side of Josh? What what does your day typically look like? Do you, are you an early riser? Do you have coffee in the morning? Do you have breakfast? What do you have? I do tend to like to wake up in the morning and all well, everybody wakes up in the morning, right? But, um, <laughs> but earlier, you, but you like to, <laughs> I, I do like to, I, I like that sort of morning rhythm of, uh, I, I, get, I do, I'll, I'll have some coffee. I, I have some, this isn't juice. I actually have coffee in here. I had some, just a little bit left, but probably cold. No, it's a little bit cold, which isn't a problem. I like, cold do coffee. you eat breakfast? I don't usually I'll have lunch later. Really? Yeah. Okay. So you just are not hungry when you wake up? No, not hungry. And apparently they say that it's healthy if you can condense your eating within a smaller window of time. Okay. So I follow so, that. So you get up early, like a farmer, and you yeah. have and you just have coffee. And yeah. what do you do I, in the morning? Um, I um well, it depends on kind of what my project is on, on my plate. So for a long time I had this book that I had been working on. And I'd kind of work on it every day, kind of obsessively, actually. Um, but I would break it apart. What's it about? This is the book on persons. Um, oh, cool. About our existence and our origin. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So the I title is Who that. Are You Really? And um, I can give you a link to that. But absolutely. I just, I've been working on it kind of obsessively the last few years. So I just finished the index and sent that over the publisher, went through final, final revisions. And I kind of gave myself permission to just relax a little bit. Um, cool. so morning, you know, I, I'll check Twitter, check Facebook. Um, I do have some new projects coming due, some chapters. I got to work on those, but pretty much just kind of thinking and writing in the morning. And what, what do you do a normal work day? Is it like, cause some of these people are like working like eight to five. Is that your work day? Do you, I kind of organize it that. like that? Or? I kind of, I, I am sort of a time person. So yeah, it used to be that, um, I would have these hours like till six, um, but then in, you know, having more kids and I've, I've kind of in a way modified my, my schedule. So I'm spending more time with Rachel. And so cool. I think kind of my ideal day is I have that sort of morning time of thinking, reflecting, writing, and then come home still maybe in the morning, maybe late morning and have a conversation with Rachel. And we do this and we'll, we'll have kind of morning time together. We'll have like morning dates sometimes. So you go elsewhere to work on your book? Yeah, I usually go to like a coffee shop. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
can gotcha. you can work around crowds no problem yeah i like that it works for me to do that way oh um, to have the people there and um and then but you know i'm teaching classes so oh, after yeah. that morning rhythm on the t class teaching days i'll you know teach my classes and that's kind of yeah. how it works yeah and do you take weekends off do you bring work home like do you on the weekends i take the weekends are devoted to kind of like our house projects and connection mm -hmm. and family but see mm -hmm. the great thing about philosophy is that i can mm -hmm. always be working on it in my mind yeah. Yeah, yeah so it actually works really well for me is that i have this rhythm where it like, could be a blessing it could be a curse it 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 helps me sleep at night like if i have trouble sleeping I'm like let's work on a philosophy problem <laughs> It does. Do you take naps? I do. Yeah. Uh, so naps are good. Catch up on sleep. Wow. So that that's that that works because then like if I'm working with Rachel on our yard, probably mowing the lawn or I'm holding the baby or whatever, is nice because I can still be working on certain questions in my mind, uh, making progress there. How many kids do you have? Five. Five? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. How old is the last one? He's uh, like six. Well, oh yeah, six months. The first one's thirteen six years. Months, jeez. Yeah. It seems five. like just a year ago you only had four kids. Time, yeah. Time flies. Yeah. Wow, that's man, crazy. six months. That's that's crazy. You got five kids. Wow. Are you sure you're not a Mormon? Are you? So wait, hold on a sec. Did you believe Jesus come talk to the Indians? No. Okay. Uh, it's not part of my. Are you Catholic? Uh, I haven't looked into that. Uh, I'm, I'm not, and I don't affiliate with Catholic, although I, I do feel like the historic tradition of Catholicism is something that I've grown to appreciate more than me I too. had previously. Me too. Yeah, me too. Me too. Well, Josh, I, uh, I've enjoyed this time with you for the last two hours. Um, Thank you. and I'm, I'm sure that there are people that are going to be blessed by this in the future and when they're hearing my voice right then that will be the present for them at that time and uh so thanks for hanging out with us josh and helping us uh talk about philosophy yeah thank you it's really wonderful to be with you again and that sort of sense of humor is just beautiful and you combine that with a strong intellect and i just appreciate the work that you do i, I feel like thank one you. thing i notice in our conversation is you have a talent. I think sometimes people take for granted their own talents because they come so easy <laughs> to themselves, but you have a talent for taking complicated ideas and displaying them in very concrete ways. <laughs> like even when you were talking about, you know, the chairs at church, you know, you were in walking, like you're using these very concrete visual anchoring pictures. And <laughs> that is hard to do. I find that personally difficult when I do it, it's because I'm, I'm working to do it. It's not come naturally for me. Um, and so I see you do that very well. And, and I, I love that. So yeah, just, I'm glad to be with you. And, and I just imagine Thank that you. You, the work that you're doing goes out and has those positive ripple effects because you're not a puppet of the mindless grains of reality. You're making yeah. choices to affect the world. So how cool is that? And I thank you very much for that. I, it means a lot to me that you said that. So yeah thank you yeah, yeah cool all right thanks josh uh josh dr josh rasmussen uh we'll send we'll put all the links up that you send and thanks for being here thank you